and we are back in Vegas again. I'm here with my man, Justin Berry, and he is the one of the producers on the YouTube channel for Ryan Pineda. I guess that would be your, is that your title, producer? Right. Yeah, producer. he's the producer, and of course, we, uh, we have a podcast with Ryan Pineda after this as well, back to back, and then Brian uh, Davila just asked us if we wanted to be on his podcast, yeah. so who, who knows? We may we may stack it up, but ultimately here for the Inman Connect, and then we're uh, going on Sean Kelly's podcast oh, on, on Thursday. So it's going to be, it's a full week. Welcome back for another episode of Wealthy Creator. Uh, it's a pleasure today. I got a good friend, I guess, and a good, uh, you know, I, I look at this guy, really, he is one of the coolest and laid back dudes I, I've worked with in terms of like content creators and professionals. And so I really admire his style. I really admire what he's doing with his platform. Um, just to not, not hold you up any longer, let me introduce Levi. What's up, man? <laughs> What's up, Justin? How are you? I'm all good, man. Can't complain. It's good. I'm happy to have you here, man. Like, you know, we've been kind of going, you know, working together for what, three, three months now, three, four months? Maybe four or five, yeah. Okay, yeah. It's been a, it's been a little while now, and um, uh, I'm happy to finally get you here and, you know, you taking out your time. I want to thank you for taking this time and really sitting and talking with me today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm just going, you know, I'm going to jump straight into this thing, man. I, I, I really, I think people that are going to watch this podcast and, and listen to this, uh, this is about content creation. This is the Wealthy Creator Podcast. And so we really want to talk about, you know, that side of your business. Um, and so you know, just to, you know, kick it off straight forward, how, you know, beneficial has it been since you first started your content creation and <laughs> posting on this process? Well, I mean, content creation probably accounts for 98% of our business. Okay, so wow. it's it's pretty dramatic. So I would say it's been very important. Okay. All right. Tell me more about like how you got started with the, the process. Yeah. So uh, I got my business partner back here uh, behind the scenes. So gracious enough, uh, he allows me to have the spotlight most of the time, which is <laughs> very nice. But, uh, you know, we started this, you know, back in December of 2020. And it was something that uh, I, had, I had a previous business, financial services. I worked with all the teachers on retirement planning at, at schools. And so I visited teachers. My goal is like to have three to five appointments every single day. But I did that all through email marketing. We'd email mm -hmm. market uh, and, and go to meet with teachers. And I worked Monday through Friday, weekends off. I had the teacher schedule, but like five times the teacher's income. So it was really cool because I traveled the world and was we're just having a good time. And then 2020 happened and the world shuts down, <laughs> travel shuts down, school shut down. And so I found myself sitting there going, uh, okay, what's the next move? Because we had no idea would schools ever open up again? Would the world ever be the same? What was going to happen? Uh, I wasn't going to get a job because there was also 30 million layoffs at that time. So over the summer, I just had to sit there and reevaluate and ask myself some different questions, which is uh, how do I start over without starting over? First of all, I was 41 years old at that time and something I'd been in sales for 20 plus years and I was really kind of burnt out on prospecting <laughs> because you know sales is a never-ending prospecting game if you really want to be good at sales and so I was just sitting there trying to figure out new ways to generate business and what business was I going to move into now I've, I've got a lot of good friends in real estate uh, real estate agents, but I also saw how hard they worked in the beginning because that all starts with lead generation. It all starts with prospecting. It starts with, you know, uh, shaking hands and kissing babies. But also during 2020, that was something that was, you know, there weren't networking events going on. Like everyone's kind of hanging out, but I start to watch real estate grow over, over the summer of 2020. And I got some really good friends saying, Hey, now's the time to get into real estate. But I was 
scared to death really of starting over and trying to prospect my way into success, mm -hmm. which, and, and so I, I was thinking, okay, there has to be a different way. Now, at the same time, if you're at my age range, which is that 40 year old age range or above, we, we have this love hate relationship with social media. <laughs> so, you know, we didn't grow up with it. It wasn't there in high school. Yeah. Uh, you know, it wasn't there really even in college. It came around probably late twenties whenever, you know, Facebook, MySpace came out. Actually, I remember, yeah, I was, I was actually in Iraq uh, in, uh, with the military in 2005, I think, when MySpace came out. Yep. And we were talking about it. Like we could barely log online, <laughs> take 10 hours or 10 minutes for just to get a connection. And then we're like, oh, we got to check the MySpace. <laughs> and, and so I, I, was, I was really kind of antisocial, my antisocial media, I should say, uh, throughout, you know, my adult life because – I think, again, for a lot of people at my age, we look at it, it, it came late in the game, and we thought it was people, uh, you know, bragging, posting their lunch, silly cat videos. We looked at it from the consumer side, and so we thought there's not much use to it. But you see the 20 and the 30-year-olds start to make money, and you're going, okay, well, maybe there's something to this now. So uh, over the summer of 2020, that's where I started to think about if I'm going to move into real estate, could I actually generate business a different way? And plus, could I attract business? This word attraction mm -hmm. was just stuck in my mind. Like, I didn't know, is that even possible to build out some sort of marketing or campaign where people just come to you ready to go. Cause I was so used to just outbound yeah. prospecting, whether it was cold calling or I've done door knocking, I've chased down people. I've worked in retail stores where people came in with no intentions to buy something and you have to, you know, pursue them and go after them. So all these different scenarios that I just really didn't want to do again. So that's where I thought, okay, well it is probably going to be social media, but I didn't want to get caught up in the, the issue of going on five different platforms. Because I think that's a big mistake when people get started is they take the advice of somebody else and somebody will tell them, okay, now you're a real estate agent. Now you're a financial advisor. Now you're a, a flipper. What, it doesn't matter what you are. You need to be everywhere. That, that's what they'll tell people in the beginning. And so they say, okay, now you've got to open up Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. And I think in, in that scenario, you end up spending – you know, or giving 20% of your effort across wow. five different platforms. So I, I figured that would be a trap I didn't want to get into. So I thought I want to pick one platform. If I'm going to go down the social media route, I don't want to just uh, be everywhere at first. Mm -hmm. I want to focus on one platform and see if I can generate business from that. And if I can become successful from there, then it would make sense to maybe branch out later on. So did a lot of research and tried to figure out what was that platform because I, I was starting from scratch. And I never had a presence. I had like 300 Instagram followers, which were like friends and family. Mm -hmm. I had a couple hundred people on Facebook, which was all my high school buddies, you know, uh, hadn't, didn't even have TikTok. Uh, I had a YouTube channel before, but I was kind of like everybody else. I dabbled and made some YouTube videos early on, but had no clue what I was doing, never studied the platform, never tried to understand it. And so I, just like everybody else, made a few videos didn't see much results. And so I stopped making awesome. videos, right? So, you know, I just started looking at that Facebook, Instagram, TikTok were the first platforms I looked into because that's what everybody was telling me to do. Uh, TikTok, especially in 2020, because every real estate agent was waking up with like 10,000 followers, right? And they're like, sweet. But I didn't really see people turning over a lot of business from that. So, uh, YouTube was really the last choice. And, but what I started to understand was that YouTube was a search engine, not, not a social media platform. And so that started to fit more with my personality because I also realized, okay, uh, I really kind of had this concern about being that guy, you know, that 40 year old also saying, Oh, by the way, I'm a real estate agent now. Make sure you call me to if you, for all your buying and selling needs. Yeah. Like I, I, that just, that scared me to death. Like I didn't want to do that. And I didn't want to, you know, everybody to kind of look at me as starting over again. Uh, I kind of wanted to do this secret agent style, but that's not really how you generate business is secret agent style. So I was really torn on that. But as I started to dig in more into YouTube and study the platform, and that's where I, I really start to dig in. And I um, have this term called hyper learning that I love to say that you can really hyper learn any subject in about 60 days. And if you do that, which means you focus everything with all the information on uh, Google, uh, YouTube, books, uh, you know, the w websites, blogs, everything is out there. If you want to choose a subject, the information is there that you could learn it 100% for free or buy a couple of books. Put in any subject on Amazon <laughs> 
and 20, 50, 80 books will pop up right in a row. And, and so I bought uh, like eight YouTube books, eight two uh, YouTube marketing books because I like books. I'm still kind of a book person, a little bit of that old school, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's funny. So from there, the authors of those books were the ones that got me to go to their channels. Mm. A big one was YouTube Secrets, uh, Benji okay. Travis and Sean Cannell. And that, that book really kind of set things off for me. It really got me extremely curious because I started to understand the platform and understand the platform from a producer versus a consumer side. And so that's what really triggered uh, that, that whole process. And then Benji mentioned in there just one little paragraph in that book that he started a real estate channel in 2009 mm -hmm. and he went from doing 10 deals a year and almost getting out of the business because he was broke to doing over a hundred deals the next year because of his YouTube channel in 2009. Wow. That's a big deal. So that's what really got me intrigued and interested. And so I thought, okay, maybe, maybe YouTube is the platform. And, and then I started to, once I really started to understand it's a search engine, then I thought, you know, the other issue is, is that I'm, I'm not a great real estate agent. I was a brand new real estate agent. So, uh, you know, making TikTok videos or something where I'm explaining things. I mean, I could read about a VA loan or an FHA loan and regurgitate that information, but I hadn't done it. Yeah. I hadn't completed a transaction yet. So I also had a little bit of imposter syndrome. Like, okay, I mean, I'm a good salesperson, but I do have to believe a hundred percent in what I'm selling. So I could read stuff and regurgitate it, but that didn't seem right. So what I did was I, I realized I know Dallas though. I'm, I'm in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. and I've lived there for 20 plus years. I know the neighborhoods and the suburbs. And so as I started to dig in and find out that YouTube was more of a search engine, then it made sense the, that I found that uh, people are searching neighborhoods and suburbs and areas. And it's like, okay, well, if I can educate people in the areas versus, versus I'm a, such a great real estate agent, which I wasn't. Uh, then then maybe that would work out. So that's really kind of how the whole journey started there was just through uh, research and development. <laughs> really, yeah, I mean, yeah. and and I didn't watch Tiger King over tw <laughs> over the summer of 2020. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I just I was in a different mindset because I, I, my world had just came to a screeching halt. My financial services business I'd been building for the last five years, it was going great. 2019 was my best year. 2020, the first quarter was my, I was outpacing 2019 by 40%. Wow. And then literally like that, the world shuts Changed. down. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, I was like, okay, what's the next step? And so I had to do a, some serious soul searching and, and really dig in and, and realize that uh, you have to understand these platforms from the producer side versus mm -hmm. the consumer side. And if you treat YouTube like a hobby, it'll pay you like a hobby. If you treat it like a business, it'll pay you like, like a, a business. business. And that's really the case on any platform. I love that. I love it. Like, I, you know, you said a lot. And so I'm going to touch on some <laughs> yeah. of those things, right? But one thing that you keep bringing up is the consumer versus the producer yep. side of this. And I think that's where people make their mistake, right? Because most people come in as the consumer, yep. right? Where they're intaking all of this content. And a lot of times they're, they're almost, they're unconscious to what's actually happening to them. Like I'm making you my supporter without you even knowing it. You're just enjoying the content, right? And so, you know, you talked about, you know, kind of being from an older generation before social media actually plays its part. And I feel the same way. Like I'm 35 years old <laughs> and I got in, you know, that Facebook era. I remember MySpace, but MySpace I wasn't really big into. And that Facebook era when it was just like college students, we were yep. sneaking emails in on, the, on that right. platform to kind of be involved with the college students. And I can kind of remember at that point, I was like, oh, okay, getting followers is kind of cool, right? Like people are paying attention to like how you, how many people are following you. Then I was like, yeah, I don't care about that. I'm not doing that, right? And so I kind of fell off. I was like, I'm not even about to do any of this kind of game of popularity. I already had my friends. I already was who I was at my high school, so I didn't care anymore. And then as I was in college is when I realized, oh, the individuals that stuck to like making content mm -hmm. were having all of these connections out of college. Yep. And I was like, all oh, these relationships were built online and I didn't have a lot of those. I had them through sports, but I didn't have them through like the online community that was doing other things. And so when it was time to kind of look for new opportunities or, you know, get the job that you're looking for. It was a little bit more difficult. And so that's when my mind shifted. I was like, okay, you have to actually be active on these platforms in order to make these connections. Um, so I, I think to that, though, really what uh, is really good to state is that it's never too late to kind of partake right. in this, yep. you know, in these platforms. Because, like you said, you were, 
you know, trying to vibe for a few minutes while you're out in the military, trying to figure out when can I, you know, get on here just to check some statuses, right? Yep. And so that, but that speaks to how powerful the tool is, right? Because I know you had way more important things to do when you were doing that. And so I guess I want to pose the question to you again, um, you know, what advice would you give to an older, maybe real estate agent or, you know, someone who's in, in a type of field like that? Because I got my own opinion on real estate agents, <laughs> yeah. right? I've worked with a few from, you know, you know, basic markets to luxury market agents. And it's like, you know, they never really seem to get ahead, right? Like when they, when, especially when it comes to the finance side of things, right? Yeah. It's like, they're always really trying to work really hard to kind of almost make up for what they didn't get the last month. That's what it always felt like to me. And I was like, oh, man, like, I just want my retainer you know, fee, right? Like, yeah. I got to wait to next month to get the retainer fee. I thought you were selling million-dollar homes, or I thought you were selling, you know, six or seven homes a month. But it's not really like that. So a lot of it is the image, not necessarily the result. Yeah. And then I learned, too, like, it's like the 1% that are really doing really good. And that's yeah. the individuals that you want to try to do business with. But I also think what is good about that, like especially the the agent side of of real estate, is that the grind, man. Like it shows you. Like if you don't grind, you just don't get it. Yep. And so I, I think a lot of times what is mistaken is that if they if they would put that same effort into what they're doing in their marketing, they would be successful. They yep. would find more opportunity, more deals. And so what would you say to a, a older individual that may be in those in those shoes right now, like today's social media like you you obviously been doing it for a little while so things are different what's the first platform they should go on youtube <laughs> i love it i mean everything you said is is exactly true that the, the old joke is is that you'll never go to a real estate agent's retirement party <laughs> yeah so it just so doesn't true. happen yeah because and why because they're actively prospecting and that's where we you know coin the phrase passive prospecting, uh, you know, which we have the book out on that as well. And that's the whole point. That's what I realized through this process. That's the other reason why I had to start over at 41 is because I was always the best salesperson. Mm -hmm. I wasn't the best marketer. And I also wasn't the best uh, leveraged of my time either. And so those were some of the other questions I asked myself during the summer of 2020, which is what went wrong? Why am I at this age, this far in the game, always a, an amazing salesperson, but I had all these, you know, when I got deployed, uh, you know, that shut down the, the you know, my, my life at that time. I came back, uh, I came back from Iraq actually with a very bad digestive disease. And that took mm. me out about eight years later. And at that time that cut me out of my, my, my job at that time as well. Yeah. And then now this happened a pandemic. So I started looking at these outside forces took me out of the picture and my business stopped. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. So if you can't remove yourself and your business doesn't keep working, yeah. then then you've got a major problem. You'll never retire. You'll never be. Uh, you'll you'll always be running month month to month, paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as I started to create YouTube videos, what I realized was that the number one thing that people tell me they don't do YouTube is because it takes time. Uh -huh. And YouTube doesn't take time. It makes you time. Yeah. And not only does it make you time, it compounds your time. That's good. So the thing is, is I started to look at these back in analytics and I'm looking at watch hours and I'm going, wait a second. You know, I, I started to realize I, I am getting a direct return of my investment of time. So somebody says, well, I don't have 30 minutes to make a video. <laughs> All right. That's what they're telling me. And I say, okay, but if I offered you uh, 12,000 hours back with your family, your friends, your relatives to go on vacation just for 30 minutes. Would you make that trade? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, look at one of our videos. It took me 30 minutes to make. It's got 12,000 hours of watch time. <laughs> First of all, that's like a uh, 11,995 uh, profit <laughs> right. on my time right, right. just from a profit standpoint. Yeah. But if you start to divide 24 hours in a day, into that 12,000 hours, that's like 1.35 years. Mm -hmm. So that 30 minute investment gave me 1.35 years worth of prospecting <laughs> back. 30 minutes. That's passive prospecting, right? And so we all love the idea of compound interest. It's supposed to be uh, one of the, the eighth wonder of the world, right? Compound interest. <laughs> well, what if you could compound your time? 
That's what you're doing through video, especially on YouTube, because one little investment of your time now, not only can you, as soon as, as soon as you invest 30 minutes and that video has been watched 31 minutes, mm -hmm. you've made a one minute profit of your time. Mm -hmm. So immediately you're likely to make a profit. Now, once it starts compounding into hours and hours, and then you can't even turn it off. And imagine if you make a second video and a third video and a fourth video, if you've ever said, I just wish there was more of me. Yeah. Well, make a, video. make a video. And then guess what? You got exactly you doing what you have to do. That's why we've been able to scale so quickly in the last two and a half years. You know, we've done 4.3 million in real estate commissions. Nice. And I got out of production after one house. I haven't even opened a door or showed a home. I haven't even written a contract. Now that's mainly because Travis took over that side of the business, yeah. but guess what? He hasn't had, he hasn't had to make a video, right. you know, he, he's not required. That's not, um, you know, in his job description, you could say with our company, but we wouldn't be here today. I, like right now, this is why agents don't go on vacation or they're not pr actually business owners in general, business owners in general get yeah. accused of not being present with their family, right? Whether it's nights, weekends, or on vacation. Why? Because they're usually thinking about the business because it's not operating on its own. It's not lead generating on its own. You know, Warren Buffett says you'll never be rich unless you can make money in your sleep. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, if your business, uh, if you can't lead generate in your sleep, you don't have a business, you have a job. Mm -hmm. So if your lead generation is directly tied to you, you're a pro that's a problem and you have a job, yeah. you don't have a business. So as soon as you can outsource that, whether that's to a team member or the easiest way to do that for, for really the least amount of money is to do it through video. Mm -hmm. You're out, outsourcing your prospecting through video. So you make that initial investment on that side of it. It goes to work for you. It gives you, um, you know, you make a profit on your time. It gives you a compound. But then that's why we've been able to do the business is because my prospecting is not dependent no, upon you. me. Yeah, and that's, and that's another thing. Like you talked about that 30 minutes, and this is what I always tell people. It's like that 30 minutes will turn into those watch hours no matter what, especially for YouTube, right? Like just make it and let it sit. It's going to happen for you, right? The people are going to start to view the video. And so what I always find interesting for people when they hesitate for YouTube specifically because they believe it takes more time is that you're, you're, you're concerned about the time without being concerned about whether or not you're wasting that 30 minutes doing something else, Yeah. right? Because I can tell you right now, there's that 30-minute lunch you can take. All you got to do is set up a camera, and you can talk yeah. while you eat if you, if you want to, right? Like, there's no – it's a no-holds bar with how you create the yeah. content. It's just taking the time to really get it out. And so, like – and I can tell you, like, anybody that's listening, Levi walks uh, – he, you know, he walks what he's talking because – one of our consultations that we did on one of our calls, um, this may be, you know, a month and a half, two months ago, I go, make your videos longer. And he goes, what do you mean? Why? And so I explained to him the whole strategy behind why you want to make them longer right now for YouTube. And I was like, if you're doing 30 minute videos, try to get to that hour. Right. To somebody else. And you were the only one like in the program that didn't give me pushback on longer content. Right. Like everybody else is like, I don't wear. That's why I'm in the program. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but they're like, where am I going to get the time to do that? I don't have time to sit down with people for an hour and do a podcast or two hours yeah. and do a podcast. I got all this stuff to do in my business. And in my mind, I'm like, you're never going to get out of that. You're never going to get out of that because of the way your mind is. Like, you're you're working backwards rather than reverse yep. engineering and really going, you know, moving in a forward direction. You was like, why? All right, let's do it. All right. And then you started to think of creative ways to make the videos that you were already going to film yep. longer. Right. And that's part of that process. That's part of being creative with your, with your process and your systems so that you can scale, you know, long term. Tell me more about your process. How do you script? How do you, you know, what? How do you go about creating the content that you're making on YouTube? Well, and just to on, just to double back on what you said, people are always most likely looking at today's cost versus tomorrow's Tomorrow. value. Yep. That's the, and whether you're spending money or spending your time, if you look at the today's cost, it's going to be very hard to see tomorrow's value. That's yeah. why people don't want to invest in marketing because they're not looking at the return. They're looking at what they're spending. Yep. I don't want to make a video because I'm looking at the time it takes me now versus the time it's going to return me in the future. So you got to shift your mindset on that and always be asking yourself, it's just like attending a conference. Yeah. Like, do I want to pay a thousand dollars for a ticket, a flight and a hotel? <laughs> no. Not really, but I know the return. Now, can I directly measure that in a monetary return? Probably not, or at least not immediately, but I can point back to very specific relationships, business deals, 
things that happened because of we were at a it's, conference, you know, yeah, and meeting yeah. somebody. So like our whole relationship, it's, it's because, yeah, it's because we're out here, uh, you know, we're out here meeting people, you know, we wouldn't have this relationship we have if we didn't go to your conference. Uh, we didn't go to WealthCon and, and get down all these rabbit holes with you guys and, and coming here like and upgrading and paying VIP tickets. You know, that's where we saw uh, Gary Sharper mm -hmm. uh, or Harper, Gary Harper, Harper. Uh, of Sharper Solutions. Yep. You know, first time I saw him speak was at a, a VIP day here. And, I, and it was exactly what we were missing in our business. Yeah. So that return to us, even though of course he cost us more money <laughs> to pay him, again, but, but, the, again, but yeah. the return coming back on that was huge. So the ticket to, to that we bought to come here, fly here and everything, just that one introduction of that one person was the operational aspect that we were missing in our business. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs are that same way because they usually don't have that operational side dialed in. Yeah. You know, they're all blow and go and, you yep. know, visionaries and then yep. leave a, a, all the dust in the wake. So, <laughs> so you have to get that stuff, but yeah, I mean, I, going, I always use that analogy where you're like a freshman playing on varsity. Yeah. I always say that because that's exactly what it is. You, by time people are like those individuals that don't want to invest in themselves just yet. And they're kind of just making the mistakes as they're going. Right. And then they're learning and they're having to fall and then get up again and do it all over again. By the time they get to where you're at today, Right, you've been far excelled yeah. because you've been playing against the competition already. Yep. You've been playing at an elite level already, and so it's just important for people to know that, right? Like I just got back from a ten day trip. I went Houston, I went Atlanta, and I went to Chicago. Atlanta, I got a chance to talk to some individuals. There were there were people that were hosting the event that I wanted to connect with. My goal was to connect with them, share some of the information that I have, some of the experience that I have, and hopefully next year I'll be on that stage. Right. That's my goal. I accomplished that goal. I had to have that conversation. We exchanged those phone numbers. We're texting back and forth. But my goal was really to go not to attend the event to, to gain a bunch of knowledge because it was an intermediate level. Like I had knew most of the information. I had knew that. But I knew the speakers that were going to be there and that they were going to be super useful to the acceleration of my path. And that's what it was about. It cost me. Right. Yeah. I had to pay to go there. I had to I had we had to get the ticket. We had to get the hotel. We had to get the flights. But that I, didn't, I don't get anything up front from that. Right. But hopefully next year when I have the opportunity to get on the stage and I can actually talk about a product that I have and I can offer up them yeah. wealthy creator, Pineda Media or whatever the product is at the time. When I have that opportunity, then I get to see that return and I get to see where the value is in what I just invested in a year ago. And so it's just 100 percent true. Right. Like yeah. like play up to the competition. Don't play down to, you know, your limiting beliefs or play down to your experience. Play up to other people's experiences. Right. And I'm just, you know, Ryan Pineda has shown the way, really. Right. Yeah. Like I, I, I get to sit up under him and really learn those things. Right. Like and those connections, like these events, I've connected with so many different people. Right. And so it's, it's been a pleasure to kind of. To kind of do that, but yeah, well, look at look at Omar, right? Omar yeah. is a good example, I think, of someone who's been doing the work, doing yep. the reps, you know, showing up, uh, you know, and doing that really for another company, mm -hmm. and now what launched his own podcast studio program, coaching, yeah. and I think I saw a reel the other day. He's talking about he had, you know, Im immediate audience, right? Yep. Immediate clients, because he's been building that up, even if it was with somebody else uh, as the main focal point or the company as this main focal point, that's okay. Because as long as you're out there working with people, providing value, yep. when you're ready to launch your own thing, it's it's, it's time to go. Yeah. And last year, you know, we went to 25 conferences last year. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And we spent, uh, uh, if you look at our P&L, it was about 130000 last year on, on travel, uh, tickets, everything else. And that was just something that we were willing. And I knew that because I knew the more conferences we were going to, that's why we've also developed a very strong brand in the real estate space mm -hmm. so quickly is because people are seeing us over and over, whether we're speaking or not. Mm -hmm. Now, we've gotten a lot of opportunities to speak, which is great. And that accelerates your brand even more. But most of those speaking opportunities came from showing up at these conferences over and over and over again because you see the same people, the right people, the important people. Yep. They're like, man, you're at every conference. You're at every conference. Well, Guess who's at the, every conference? Uh, corporate staff, influencers, the people that matter, you know, yep. really. And so those opportunities keep coming up and we keep getting invited. I was just at the gym this morning at the Aria. We're staying at the Aria okay. Hotel. Mm -hmm. And I saw um, for the brokerage we're with the the president of global operations for wow. the company. <laughs> well, and you know what's gym. funny is that we're good friends. Why? Because over the last two years, 
He's always in the gym whenever I am at 5 a.m. Mm-hmm. at the hotel. You know, instead of staying up all night partying with everybody at the hotel bar, yeah, yeah. I go to the hotel gym as soon as it opens up, and we run into each other. I didn't even know he was coming, but we've developed, we call each other uh, conference gym buddies, you know? <laughs> wow. But he's been very responsible. He's what um, he's what helped introduce us to get our our coaching platform as a, as a preferred partner mm. with the exp brokerage Mm -hmm. which just doesn't happen and so we're the only approved youtube program for real estate agents for exp and they have ninety thousand agents wow yeah so i mean and that came from going to conferences but also going to the gym and running into this the right guy over and over again and so now now those opportunities spring up wow wow no that's incredible and and i i can say it like we, we host these events so many times a year that it's like, yeah, like getting in these rooms. And I, I used to say that when I was younger, too, because playing basketball, it was always – it was never how good you were. It was about yeah. who you know, and, right, and so the, how you can get connected with the college coaches, with the, you know, with the professional agents, right? And so I was always like, if you just let me get in the room, I'll yeah. make sure that I perform well enough to catch somebody's attention. or I'll make sure that I do what I need to do to, to connect the dots. And so I, I, I love that you're saying that, right, and I, and I think people really need to focus in on – your upfront investment to what is going to kind of carry out later as, you know, your value. And so it's amazing, amazing to see. But I want to go back to, I want to, because I want to give the creators watching, yep. an, you know, really a lot of value on the process, right? Like I've actually got a chance to kind of talk with you plenty of times about your process and how you how you create the content, right? And, um, you know, uh, your YouTube channel, you do it, right? Like you're doing YouTube at an elite level. And so talk about how you plan, prepare, and actually film your content. Yeah, I would say uh, it's it has been a lot more off the cuff than than what I would do is I would take topics. I, I look at research topics because uh, I found that a lot of our stuff is research driven. Mm-hmm. Now, after talking to you, you're going to tell me otherwise and <laughs> tell me I need to be more in browse, which actually our last uh, couple of videos yeah, are picking up big time in browse. We're coming for it. Uh, but the thing is, is that I, I'm looking for intentional people. Mm-hmm. So there's, you know, most people conduct marketing through interruption marketing, which is cold calling, door knocking, postcards, flyers, billboards, TV commercials. Mm -hmm. That's interrupting what people are doing. That's why you have to market so many times or retarget or on Facebook, you have custom audiences and lookalike audiences and all these things to target people to hit them over the head again and again and again until they finally buy from you. Where intention marketing, you know, people become intentional about buying or selling real estate, something happens in their life that they say, it's time to move. It's mm-hmm. time to buy a house. It's time to sell our house. So when that happens, they become intentional. If they start searching, then they're searching specific things. And the cool thing is, is YouTube and Google tells us what they're searching. Right. So that information is out there. So whatever your business is, that's the point of passive prospecting as well. It's a whole chapter in our book mm-hmm. is content research and creation. So to go out there and research first and say, okay, if I create a video that I want to make, I have no idea what the audience level is. I have no idea the interest level. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of creators come into the space too. And it takes them years and years and years to gain traction, if any, is because they they do what they want to do, which nothing wrong with that, but that's probably a longer path as to where if there's people that are searching very specific topics, especially in your business, then you can find out what that is and make those videos first. Rank them, but you can find the search volume. And so- that's creating the content that people are already looking for that are intentional and putting it in front of them. That's going to give you a much quicker, uh, you know, start to, to getting found sooner rather than later, which is what I did. I started searching which suburbs. I looked at all the suburbs of Dallas, Texas. What's the most searched? And then I started looking at neighborhoods, most searched topics of Dallas, you know, when you're making a move in Dallas or moving to or moving from. So I ranked all those. So that's, that's the whole macro level research that, that I would do. Then I would look at, Okay, let's say a suburb of Dallas is Frisco, Texas. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, what? How many videos can I make about Frisco, Texas? Well, pros and cons. Very simple. A map video, uh, a neighborhood tour. Um, you know, top neighborhoods. You know, so right there, I've got four videos. Four videos. And now, if I've got ten neighborhoods, guess what? I've got forty videos. That I can do right there yeah. because I figured out I've looked at everything from the macro and that you start to work down, you reverse engineer it. And so now I'm going to say, OK, I could do cost of living as well and I could do house price, you know, all these types of things. So really, I, I have probably 20 to 30 topics per suburb. And if I've got 10, 15, 20 suburbs, it's game over. You got a year's worth of content. Right. 
And then I just need to make it. So pros and cons, I've never scripted anything. It's always been, uh, now I did script the intro in the beginning. Uh, I had this intro and call to action that was really very repetitive. Started to back away a little bit from that this day and age, but I'm still a little torn on that. So we'll have to talk about that some other time. But, (laughs) but the, uh, you know, say a pros and cons of Frisco, uh, I know my areas and this is what I always encourage to entrepreneurs as well. Uh, especially real estate agents. I'm like, look, you know your area. So to me, it's a lot of work. If you try to write out a whole video script, you've got to write that whole thing out. You know, first of all, to me, that's way longer than saying, okay, I've got some bullet points. I should be able to ask you if I came to your town and you're going to show me around town, uh, you know, or tell me about your business, I should be able to ask you very specific things and you should be able to talk for two to three minutes. So if I, if let's say pros and cons, I say, okay, I want to list out five good things and five bad things about Dallas, Texas. Well, that's it. I just need the bullet points, whether it's traffic, whether construction taxes, you know, um, restrictions. Okay. Those are my five topics. Well, is that good or bad? Okay. Well, if you ask me about taxes, you know, property taxes or, uh, you know, it, anything else in there, business taxes or the weather. Yeah. I should be able to talk for two to three minutes and you do that in increments of two to three minutes. So, uh, that's another thing is people look at a 20 minute video and they say, well, I can never talk for 20 minutes. (laughs) Well, you're not, you're talking for maybe increments of two to three minutes, starting and stopping. The editing makes the magic, you know, everything seems together in the end. So if you can talk for two to three minutes, make sure you start your point, uh, you know, talking point with a good starting point, ending with a good starting point. Mm-hmm. That way it makes it easier for the editor to chop. And I would have notes right beside me. Oh, here's my pro. I'm going to talk about the weather. And I would start out and say, so the weather in Dallas sucks. You know, it's very extreme. It's on, it's either super hot or it could get really cold, you know, and then I could, I could ramble for two to three minutes right. and then I stop and that's it. You check the notes. Yeah. I'd look at my notes. And I look at my notes and I say, okay, traffic. Yeah. Well, traffic in Dallas sucks. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> You're always under, everything's under construction. And I just talk for two or three minutes and then I stop and then I go through there. And what happens is, is if you got five topics for three minutes each, you know, that's 15 minute video. Mm-hmm. Well, now you, you do that on the pro side. You do that on the con side. Now you've got a 30 minute video. And it's like, you just made a 30 minute video talking for two to three, in, two to three minute increments. Yep. And this is what I tell, you know, especially cause I have a lot of conversations with real estate agents is I, I'll go, if I came to your town right now to buy a house and you took me around and I started asking you questions, you know, you talk, you tell me, right. Mm-hmm. You don't get a redo. You don't get a script that yeah. you don't walk in and say, Oh, let me check my script. I'm like, so why do you need a script? You just really need the reminder, the bullet point, something to kind of refresh your memory and, and trigger. Now, the problem is, is that you're by yourself, you know, recording right. this, looking into yeah. a camera. So the other thing is, is that a lot of people always ask about fear of the camera. Mm-hmm. For me, I never had a fear of the camera. I had, what I did get used to was having a conversation with a, with an object mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> that, that does, I was yeah. so used to belly to belly cells, mm-hmm. looking at facial ins- ex- expressions, nods, interruptions, questions, body movement, uh, reading people, you know? And yeah. so all that's what I've always done. So whenever you sit there and you just stare at a camera and you have to have a discussion, it's weird. Yeah. It's awkward in the beginning, yeah. but what isn't awkward in the beginning? Mm-hmm. Anytime you start something, something new. new, I tell everybody that I first start with on their first initial call, I tell them straight up, I said, the same feeling that you're getting, yeah. looking into that lens is the same feeling that everybody had, right? I was like, you're looking at a finished product when you see a Ryan Pineda video, right? You're looking at 3,000 videos a year, three years straight of making content, right? Like, that's mm-hmm. a finished product right now, right? Like, And now he's just on autopilot and on repeat. But when you buy a new car, you see the finished product. What that car looked like before the paint job, you would hate it. Right. Mm -hmm. What that car looked like before it was structured and put together, you wouldn't want anything to do with it. And so don't pay attention to the finished product. Right. Like you're working to get to your finished product. But looking into that lens is awkward no matter what, no matter who you are. There's nobody that did it and was like, oh, that was great. Right. Like, no, everybody starts there. And so you got to just kind of know that going into it, too. Right. Like, yeah, this is going to feel weird. This is the first day of school. Right. Like, it's going to feel weird. I don't know anybody. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm the smart one in the class anymore, right? Like, I don't want to answer the wrong, say the wrong answer. It's okay, right? Like, it's okay. I dropped my son off first day of school today, and I looked at him before he walked in. I said, you're the leader, and it's okay to make mistakes, but you're going to do great, and your teacher loves you. Go be great. 
right? Like, those were just my words to him. Like, understand that you don't have to follow what other people are doing. Yeah. You lead, but you also are be confident enough to make the mistake, right? Like, you're not in any trouble if you say the wrong answer. In fact, that's going to be the learning moment for you, right? Like, you learn more making the mistake than you do actually probably trying to get every answer correct. And so it was, it was like having that conversation. I'm doing it the same thing with adult entrepreneurs that are making money on their business. I'm like, yo, like, you, you made mistakes in business before, right? Yep. Like, you lost some money somewhere. I know you did, right? And so, but it's okay. You bounce back, right? You did it again, and you just stay, you know, consistently doing it. And so, yeah, I love that about, you know, you jumping into YouTube specifically, right? Because it's a little easier to do those 30-second videos because yep. I can read line by line on a 30-second video. Nobody's going to know to the edit. Or I can just speak for 30 seconds and be okay. The YouTube, the longer version, they, people need to hear that because they need to understand that you don't have to go straight through for 30 minutes straight, you know, on information that you know or may not know, right? And I always tell people, too, talk about what you know. You're only an authority in what you know. You're not really truly an authority in stuff that you're researching and then regurgitating, right? Like, And so it's important to just, you know, be an expert at whatever it is. And talk about that, right? Like, and it's okay. But right? it is one of the fastest ways to learn is to teach something, right? Yeah. And, you know, what's funny is that a lot of feedback I get from uh, from agents that go through our programs, they say, you know what? I never realized how much this is helping me understand my neighborhoods and areas yeah. better. Yeah. Because they do, if, if you do a little bit of research uh, beforehand, especially on you're going to do a neighborhood, why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to work that area and you've never really spent time in there, and that's hard to do sometimes, if you, especially if you live in another area, well, you read a couple of blogs, you know, maybe watch a couple of other videos. There's probably some, uh, there's probably some travel guide or somebody's done a YouTube yeah. video on this and area if, or that. Yeah. If you're in Dallas, Levi's already done it. So you just <laughs> yeah. go to his YouTube channel exactly. and oh, yeah. you everything you need. We get that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> People would be like, I just went to your channel and copied everything. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. you're doing it for it, him. It's for public. Sure. Yeah. So go for it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. But that, that process is, is great. Like, you know, you were just like, I am going to research, mm -hmm. and then I am going to present in a way that is specific to an audience, right? And so talk a little bit nowadays, because you hear both sides of this. You should be niche, or you should be broad and do a little niche here and there. Like, people are all over the place with this. What are your thoughts? Because you are, like, your channels are, specific, like, really niche. Yeah. Right? Like you said, you hit a lot of search, right? That's the majority of probably what you've grown so far. Um, and, you know, I have my own thing, you know, we're, we're working on it and you talked a little bit about it, but tell me for somebody that may be an agent and they may be doing a little content here and there, but not necessarily all in just yet. What do you think they should do? How should they start? Yeah. I mean, I think hyper local is, is very important. I, I, I don't know any other real estate channels or at least real estate agent channels doing the volume we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned earlier, two and a half years, 4.3 million in commissions, so I find channels that are broad that that do national real estate news, especially right now that are there, you know, there are a lot of crazy things in the market. <laughs> yeah. So anything negative definitely draws <laughs> eyeballs. Work. Right. And I know agents that their business model is not to work with clients, but to collect referrals. So the thing about in real estate, if I give you a client, you can, you know, I ask for a referral. Well, usually that's 25 percent. Well, if that's a $10,000 commission on that property, I can make $2,500 just from referring you somebody. Mm -hmm. So I know agents that have a national audience, they don't show homes in their local market. So they talk about general broad based real estate, mm -hmm. uh, but they get referrals. But also, you know, they might be making a, a one, two, three, 400,000 a year at the most that I've ever heard, maybe 300 uh, a K a year at the most, which is great um, for that person. I want to do more than that, right. you know, and, and, you know, I'm kind of like a really a, a super affiliate for selling homes. <laughs> this is the way you look at it because I, I don't go out and show homes. I don't open doors, mm -hmm. but I'm focused so much on the local market that we get a million dollar client. I mean, that could be a 30 K commission. That's a huge affiliate yeah. <laughs> commission, right? Yeah. For me making a video, I'm not answering the phone calls. I'm not talking to the clients. I, none of that. Mm -hmm. So we do a client appreciation event twice a year, and that's where I talk to most of the clients. And I'll tell them, hey, you know, we're holding this event. You want to come over? And then most of the times when they come in there, they're like, hey, it's nice to finally meet you. You know, so they're coming because of the value of the videos, not necessarily just to work with me personally. Right. So because I'm hyper 
niched into Dallas real estate, there's a lot more opportunity to turn over real estate transactions. Mm -hmm. But now, now I'm leveraging that and moving into multifamily. Now that's something I, I do see where the channel is going to progress to. And because I, that's an investment is a much broader audience mm -hmm. and you could definitely turn over some significant income as a real estate agent. I think the more niche you go, you're probably going to make more money. Uh, but it also depends on on how you want to build that out. So you have something like investment, multifamily, like right now we're already collecting information. Investors are submitting, you know, forms for us, you know, so now we're starting to build a list, nice. uh, those types of things. I've invested in my first two opportunities as well. So, you know, that's the other thing is that I knew even within last year, I realized I don't want to be stuck in real estate transactions, you know, it's time we got to, you know, broaden ourselves out. But is that right for the channel? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been learning about multifamily for the last year, you know, and that's mainly especially coming to these conferences and you hear people talking about it. It's like, mm -hmm. that's what opens up your mind. I'm like, yep, that's that's the direction we need to go do you for the long that, game. I'm sorry. Do you believe that's the case for every agent? Like they should be looking to head more into the investment. Yeah, if they want passive income and generational wealth and yeah. they don't want to uh, be doing transactions until they're 85 years old. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Why not? Especially, you know, after I paid my taxes last year, I was like, we got we to have way more, uh, yeah. way, way more uh, to offset that. So, you know, the, the tax benefits that come with that. But, you know, I, I just I can see myself already within three to five years having a significant portfolio. I, I, I've been writing this whole year. I write out daily goals mm -hmm. and, and I write usually the same ones over and over and over again every day until I achieve them. And then I cross it off the list and I put a different goal on there. Nice. I love that. Well, one of my goals is I invest in 500 doors this year in 2023. I, I, and I say it that way. I say I invest in 500 doors in 2023. Mm -hmm. So I'm, uh, so I'm making it sound like I've already done that. Mm -hmm. And, and so at the beginning of the year, I had no idea how that was going to happen, but I just have been writing that out. I just closed on f the first 63 unit nice. project and now, we're, uh, we're about to close on 320. So just like that, just within like 30 that. days, now this is, wow. you know, if we look at, uh, we're in August, so month eight of the year. So I wrote out that goal practically mm -hmm. every day for eight months, mm -hmm. not knowing how it was going to happen. And within within a 30 day time period, I'm going to be almost at 400 units. Wow. So now that tells me I may be able to double that yeah. by the end of the year. Now that's what I'm thinking. I, I could double that. Yeah. So it's also setting those types of, but I also started my education process last year. Mm -hmm. So that's the type of person I am as well. I'm going to do a little research first, not, you know, analysis paralysis, mm -hmm. but research to help me understand. So I don't, you know, step in a hole. Uh, right off the bat. It's like, no. let me do a little research and understand. And I knew the opportunities were come plus cause I'm in the right rooms. I'm meeting the right people and that's what it all came from. And the, the people I'm working on these deals came from attending a Brad Sumrock conference last year in my See. first multifamily conference, another conference huh? that I attended. Yep. Wow. And I was there and I was just a fly on the wall and, but I met these people and here it is a year later that it's come full circle. And now I'm doing some investments with them mm -hmm. and you know what they're excited about? They're excited about YouTube, the YouTube because they've got zero marketing presence. They don't really under, you know, and so now they're like, oh, now they see how they can leverage me and they want to get me included on more deals mm -hmm. because that's the piece they're missing in their business. They got the numbers, the acquisition, the deal finding, everything else. They just don't know how I'm like, oh, I got that part. Yeah. And if nothing else, I hope you all are paying attention because if nothing else, leveraging your influence works in every case. Right, like the deals come in. Right? I can't tell you how many deals Ryan gets like offered. Yeah, right? because I I get stuff into the media inquiries about deals that they have available for you know that he may be interested in, and so you know it it it's what you're the work that you're putting in up front is allowing for everything else to work for you on the back end. And I was I even say that about the platform, especially YouTube, right? Like, yeah. and this is going back to our conversation about you know search and browse. Like, the reason why I want you to be more browse and, and and I want the platform working for you now, yeah. Right? Like you've done, you put in your time and your work in for the platform, right? And they've gained a lot from that. Believe me, all right. Now it's time for the platform to start pushing you out and working for you. And so you're going to start seeing that, you know, doing the, the different strategies and tips. But going back to what you said. It is an amazing thing when you see somebody gain an opportunity leveraging just what they do on their platform. Yeah. 
And so I, I love to hear congratulations on those on those deals. But yeah, you 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 probably will double <laughs> yeah. what your goal was by the end of the year at that rate at, at at the rate you're going. And so it's amazing amazing to hear that from you. I think you know you all have heard numbers from him now from what he's done in two years. Was it four point three? You said. Yeah. To now he's about to close on his own, you know, his personal investments. And so it's just, you know, again, if you're not doing it currently, he, he's talking, he's telling you, I, I started researching a year ago, or I started YouTube two years ago. He's telling you what he's doing, right? This is a, a play for anybody that that is willing to really commit to it and stay consistent. Um, and so, that, so that's amazing. Offer me some more insight on how important it is for to grow your personal brand right because you have you've had companies and even youtube channels have been a different name but like levi the brand itself right and and passive prospecting we're going to talk a little bit about that too but tell me how important it is for your influence to continue to grow yeah i don't think uh, i think it's very important i don't think i'm really promoting Levi Lassick as a brand right now. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, people know me, of course, but really passive prospecting is the the brand we're pushing forward. And I'm not concerned about my own personal brand, so to speak, uh, at this moment, because I think that will come with time. Mm-hmm. What I noticed, what I noticed, uh, the the most successful people I see right now, Ryan Pineda, Alex Hermosi, uh, you know, these guys built businesses and brands in the background. And so whenever they came onto social, they had a lot of business credibility backing them up, Mm -hmm. you know? So, so I think that's what I'm, I'm kind of doing opposite of what they did because we started the business and got on social right from the very beginning. And so you're seeing the growth in that journey and I'm still learning. I mean, I'm still learning every single day. And, and, uh, so therefore on the personal side, I don't have Levi last, well, I do have a Levi elastic YouTube channel, but there has, there's no videos there, uh, <laughs> except for the ones I made on my health journey from 10 years ago, which is funny, but yeah, I'll, I'll resurrect that at some point. Now I do have, you know, my Instagram is the personal brand. I do get some recognition through that and going to these conferences and things, it's very important. I mean, really all of that is my relationships are is driving a lot of this in the background, yeah. you know? And so, and, and people, it's the consistency and that's really what, to me, that's, that's branding It's consistency. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the one trait I see across the most successful people is just staying consistent on whatever it is you're doing and, you know, playing the extremely long game. Mm-hmm. Uh, they call that the infinite game, right? Simon Sinek calls it the infinite game. That was something that just made me realize, yep. No, okay. That's what I've been playing for a long time, but I think it's very important and, but building your brand out as well, you know, we want to do that and it's going to make it easier to open up new brands uh, on top of that uh, down the road. So I would say focus on that, uh, just depending on where you're at. If you've been building a business, you come out and you've had that success, you start talking about that, sharing it, you're going to probably find yourself in a situation like, you know, Ryan Pineda and, you know, these other guys that, that can because we don't have a, I don't have a million followers on social just yet, you know. Yeah, we're so it, up. yeah, it's super niche. So uh, <laughs> you know, and that's and I and I know that I think that that played a lot because he was like coming on social. Hey, uh, I've already flipped a thousand homes and five, you know, five whatever the the numbers were, and that helps out. And so we're building that journey, but I think it's very important to be present. Yeah, I mean, we you're making now like currently you're going to make the same shift that Ryan had to make too. And one thing that we had to do two years ago was we had to figure out how to get him from just being known as a house flipper yeah. and more into the entrepreneur space. Because what we started to see was the plateau of views, the plateau of following yep. on just flips, right? So you start seeing us, I mean, people that have been following Ryan Pineda or going back and, and, or, and even looking at some of his old YouTube stuff, what we were doing was like highlighting other people's businesses yep. that were related to flipping and, and doing other things outside of his niche Yep. So that we could start to gain a, a larger audience and continue to grow the following. Because, again, we saw the plateau, right? Like, it's like, you know, how many people are flipping so houses? So can I speak to that real Go quick? Go for it. Okay, so that's the whole concept behind passive prospecting. Yeah. Whenever I was – I've always wanted to write a book. You know, that's been a big goal of mine, I think, mm-hmm. since probably a teenager. I always thought that would be cool. I just never knew, okay, how would I write a book or what would I write a book about? And initially, when I started to come up – 
you know, through that process, I was just going to call the book YouTube for real estate, <laughs> you know, cause I was thinking like search terms. I'm like, well, if anybody ever gets on Amazon and searches, Oh, is there a book about YouTube for real estate? Right. My book, YouTube for real estate would pop up. Yeah. And that's what I was thinking. But then I was talking with Benji Travis and he was like, Hey man, don't worry about the book. He said, write the book, the name will come. Mm -hmm. And also I was in doing all this traveling. I was in an airport bookshelf and I was sitting there in the airport bookshelf and I realized, you know what? YouTube for real estate will never be in the airport bookshelf. Yeah. It's way too niche. Niche. Now that could be a good thing for like that part of that business. But I thought, you know what? I don't want to be talking to real estate agents forever. And that's where I started to understand, wait, this concept is much bigger than just real estate agents. This affects all entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. what we're talking about. And I thought about Ryan Serhant's book, uh, sell it like Serhan. Like, okay, he's a real estate agent, but that's really kind of a sales book. So all these things, all these experiences, all these uh, interactions, all these things that I've come across are just feeding into my mind, playing over. And I said, you know, and I don't even remember exactly where passive prospecting came from. I was but I, ask you that next. Well, I, I just, I wish I would have documented yeah, that yeah. a little bit better, but I, I think it just hit me one day and I, I was like, that's what these videos are doing. They're passively prospecting yeah. for me. I think I, I was listening to someone talk about passive income mm. and you know, the funny thing about passive income is it takes a lot of work to get there. Right, right. And so I was thinking about that and said, passive prospecting, you know what, that's a concept. And so that's what led whenever I wrote the book to write it to fit for all entrepreneurs. But my examples were real estate examples. I think about Grant Cardone too, right? He writes, uh, he, he wrote a sales book, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and right. Maybe he did that through real estate or, multi, but he's talking about the sales principles. Yeah. And so that's what passive prospecting became in the book was I was, I, I said, I want to reach all entrepreneurs. Now we're still hyper-focused on real estate agents right now. Uh, but that's where we want to expand the brand. So that was uh, that was the vision for the future is that this is a brand that can affect all entrepreneurs. Yeah. But we're going to hyper focus on real estate right now, get a lot of good results, a lot of good feedback, and then we're going to venture out from there. And that, that will open up the same thing with investing on the channel. Yep. So even though we're focusing on Dallas neighborhoods right now to attract the retail transaction, you know, mm -hmm. I know there's much bigger opportunity in investments yeah. and multifamily and things like that. So we're going to start creating content around that. Awesome. And we won't abandon what we're doing on that side, but we have to add to that and attract everything in there. So I would highly recommend that you think about these concepts and think about who your audience is, the avatar, uh, for where you want it to go, not necessarily today. Mm -hmm. And so that's what caused me to really kind of broaden that out. And now, right now we call it kind of passive prospecting for real estate agents, but, uh, or YouTube for real estate. I mean, so, but we, we know we, this can be passive prospecting for, uh, financial advisors, passive prospecting for plumbers. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so there'll, there'll be that point where you make that transition yeah. to a broader, broader audience. Right. And it comes with results. Yeah. Right. And that was the thing, like you said, Ryan said, it, he flipped 300 homes, 400 homes. And then now I can teach you other areas of real estate. Now I have the authority and the validity to do other yeah. things. And so even today, like he's just an entrepreneur finance creator, right? Like, and his full-time job is creating content. Right. And so it's like that, those transitions happen naturally through the time and through the success. So that's awesome, man. Like, I, I, I love it because I can see it. Right. Like, I, I know, like, you're about to start hitting stages. You're about to start creating, you know, your, your portfolio and investing and all these different things are going to happen for you that the transition is just going to make sense. And what's really, you know, unique about your situation that you already have a team that is doing things at an elite level that will be able to back you and help you. Um, so a few more questions I just want to get to. Tell me about your hiring process. Like, how did you find your videographer, your your partner? How does that work? Because that's always a question that we get from individuals that are just starting. Yeah, friends and family. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I met Travis at a mutual friend's house okay. one day. We just met, and then all of a sudden we, we connected a couple of months after that, and we just started talking and realizing we were, had a lot of similarities. Felt like it was a good fit. I knew actually getting into real estate, I didn't want to be a transactional real estate agent. I didn't really want to open doors mm -hmm. and show homes. Mm -hmm. And I want to do something different. Uh, find me 10 years ago, I would have been all about it. But now I realized I was the best salesperson. I was tired of being the best salesperson. I wanted to be the best marketer. So I wanted to shift. And I needed uh, a salesperson that wanted to do the sales part, not necessarily the marketing part. Mm -hmm. So when you have that, I think when you have opposite strengths, then that's when you should start 
asking, but you're aligned on the same vision, mm-hmm. that's when you should be asking yourself, should I have a partner in this, in this venture? Gotcha. So that's what led me to the partnership. Uh, our videographer, Alex came from Travis cause he worked with Alex back in the day, you know, on, nice. I saw each other at events and conferences and you know, these types of things. Wow. And so when we came to that uh, point, it was, Travis was like, I know somebody We're like, cool, let's talk to him. So we talked to him and he was it. Uh, Chrissy, who Chrissy's now CEO of our, our uh, passive productions. That's our video editing agency that we offer. Yeah. And I found her on Fiverr like five years ago. Wow. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. And she was so, ch- you know how you go on Fiverr and they put an American on the thumbnail, but then it's not an not American, American. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you try yeah. to try to do their services. <laughs> well, that's, I saw her and, and I thought, and her services were cheap that I thought, okay, this is clearly a scam. Yeah. We ended up touching base. And so she was working with me five years ago on and off as a contractor. And when mm. we started um, really getting hot and heavy in this, I finally just asked her, I was like, Hey, how do we buy you out of all your clients. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Uh, Alex was a freelance videographer and I asked him, how do we, how, what's it going to yeah, take to get take? you on, uh, on the payroll, you know, and nice. get rid of everybody else. And Chrissy has been absolutely critical to our business. Alex is, you know, key player in our business. And from there, it's been a combination of networking events. And then if we really need a position, uh, we go through sharper Mm-hmm. So, uh, sharper talent, talent yeah, yeah. T- sharper talent. Yep. Uh, we've hired some through them. I have another consulting company, uh, this last round. So we need a new operations manager. I put out a post on our community tab on YouTube mm-hmm. and we got, it worked. Dude, dude, we got a Navy SEAL apply from there <laughs> wow. and, uh, wow. we got another Navy veteran, a commander, uh, you know, it, it, it apply on there. So we got really, we got like four or five solid applications just from posting on the community tab of our YouTube channel. Cause that was the other thing that was like, Hey, if we could ever recruit from our own community, those people are probably bought into our vision. Yep. They, you know, they like our work. They know who we are or have a very good idea of who we are. Mm-hmm. So now we're probably about to hire and, and actually, um, our executive assistant, Travis's executive assistant came from a post on our community tab on YouTube. Um, <laughs> You know, so so we've hired people just through that way, through our yeah. own community. Yeah. So if they're looking to work with you, they need to get into <laughs> that community, right? Yeah. They need to buy in. Um, it, it's the same. The same thing goes for us. Like, you know, a lot of our team here in the building comes from the, the local church that we all go to. They come from, you know, another business that have moved and transitioned to a position in, in a business here. You know, so it's all like really relative, you know, and, and really like you believe in what we're trying to do here. And that, that's what makes for a good team. Yeah. Right. Like this is why you're seeing results. Right. Because they care about it just as much as you do. Um, so that's awesome. Uh, I, I love to see that. I'm not going to hold you too much longer. I always kind of try to end with, you know, a few questions, just kind of little fun questions. Um, tell me about the worst time filming a video. Like, what was what was the time where you was like, I hated doing this video. I hated how it came out. I didn't like anything about it. It was the worst experience that I had, you know, in that in the filming process. You have one, man. I just don't think it's that bad. Yeah. <laughs> what about a crazy story? Maybe like I've done. I've I've had conversations even with Brian Davila, who's over wealthy investor here where he's, like, going to check on a house that had been a, an empty and there's a guy in there holding a, a, a screwdriver to his neck, right? Like, what are some crazy things you may have seen or heard from in Dallas? I know Dallas ain't that peaceful. It can't be. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm i not going into abandoned homes and, <laughs> and flip homes, uh, that sort of thing. So, I don't know. I, I play it mostly safe. Yeah. And I haven't really had anything too crazy. I do a lot of neighborhood tours. I mean, I've been stopped several times. Like people are like, Hey, I love your videos. And wow. then they'll come over and it's interesting. I, I'll get stopped at restaurants or places like that. Probably the worst part is I've had people come up and say, Hey, I moved here because of your channel. And then I say, wait, you don't look familiar. Did you buy it? Did you call us? And they're like, no, no. They so, somebody else. So, buy somebody so, else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. You know, I, yeah. that's the funny thing I, I love to say about passive prospecting as well through YouTube is that uh, it's a reject, a rejection free. Yeah. It's rejection free. I mean, a lot of people get out of sales because they can't handle rejection. Right. But I'm like, if people don't call you, you don't know who doesn't want to work with you okay. until you meet them later on. So I've had at least five or six uh, times that I've talked to people and they said, loved your channel. I moved here for, moved to Dallas because of your channel. And then I was like, well, did you call us? Yeah, and they're like, no, no, no. <laughs> it makes me feel real awkward. That's so funny. But uh, other than that, 
it's, you know, filming in a public place sometimes that could be a little awkward for some people. It is for me too as well, but you know, most of the time I just kind of look around and I look for a little open gap or something Mm -hmm. that uh, I'll feel not as awkward and just, and then just go for it, you know? Mm -hmm. So otherwise it's been, it just hasn't been too crazy. You know, I mean, it's, it's just been steady and consistent and I've been very fortunate in that. That's great. That's great. All right. Anything else you want to leave the people with before we get out of here? Yeah, it's never too late. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Get to it. Well, I thank you all for tuning in and, and really listening to Levi and myself here on the Wealth of Creator podcast. Levi, thank you again for coming and, and, and taking this time. We will link all of his socials, links to your book. Right, We'll have all that down in the comments and in the description. Um, so please check him out, follow him, support him. Um, he's a, a wealthy creator, so he, he's going to be doing this for a long time and, and really bringing true value to our community here. And again, thank you. Thanks for having me. You guys, peace out. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you.